All right. Um, so let's let's start. Um, so um, it's um, a great pleasure to be invited here. Thanks to all the organizers, especially to Rahman for inviting me to speak about his work. Um, so um, this um, this is about um, integrability breaking. Um, and, um, and so this is a topic that's been around for a very long time, obviously, but, um, but it's um, enjoyed a bit of a comeback in the past um, few years for a bunch of reasons. Um, one major reason is that experiments have gotten much better at precisely probing um, you know, how a system that's approximately integrable relaxes when you break integrability. Um, and so, for instance, you can, you can plot things like momentum distribution, you can also plot things like transport and other um, other such um, quantities. Um, you saw something of this already in Frederick's talk this morning, but um, a lot of experimental efforts along these lines. Um, at the same time, from a more conceptual perspective, um, there's been a realization that, um, you know, relaxation of a slightly broken conservation law can be very interesting and very non-trivial. And a lot of that is um, sort of stimulated by um, papers by Aban and um, Direct and Hivnir and others like that, um, who show that, you know, contrary to some naive expectation you might have, um, for instance, exponentially long lifetimes um, for approximate um, conserved quantities. Um, and the third development, of course, is GHG itself. Um, and um, I'm not going to say anything about GHG because you've already heard all about it. Um, but the key point is that the GHC equation looks like a collisionless Boltzmann equation. Um, and that was something that was realized quite early on in, in this game. And so you might say, well, okay, so if you want to be approximately integrable, just, um, just put in a collision integral and you're done, right? Um, and, um, and so the, the problem is that's difficult because um, the content of the collision integral itself, um, as we heard, for instance, in Jerome's talk this morning, um, is really complicated, involves all these um, form factors, these matrix elements between many body states, which are separated by a large number of quasi particle occupation factors. And a lot of these um, rearrangements involve, you know, some quasi particles at least changing their momenta by a lot. So, um, umklap scattering, for instance, in lattice models is an example where you sort of scatter all the way across um, the Bruin zone, and so that's not really a hydrodynamic looking thing at all. Um, so that's the hard problem. But in addition to the hard problem, there's a relatively easy problem which says, you know, suppose I managed to get the collision integral somehow. Um, what, would, what would the qualitative features of um, dynamics in the absence of exact integrability look like? Um, so before turning to the hard problem, let's spend um, a few minutes talking about um, the easy problem. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, I have a question. Uh, yes. Very quick. Yep. So uh, why the right hand sign uh, depends only on n? Why, um, um, this, is, this is sort of very, very schematic. Um, when I say it depends only on n, it means it depends only on like the full distribution function of all the quasi-particles everywhere in the system, um, which is sort of all there is within hydrodynamics. So it's a full specification. If, it okay. depends the distribution function, that's it. Um, but yeah, and little n here with the curly brackets means that it's the sort of set of all, um, set of all um, occupation factors. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so let's, let's talk about the easy problem first. Um, so um, to start thinking about the easy problem, let's talk about what happens to a, a conserved charge. So it's a capital Q because it's um, the charge integrated over the entire system. Um, so if you didn't um, have integrability breaking, this would just be conserved because, char because it's a conserved charge. Um, when you add um, um, integrability breaking, you have a collision integral on the right. Um, in general, this collision integral depends again on the full spatial temporal on this full spatial distribution function. But on the other hand, um, we're thinking about um, slowly varying hydrodynamic sorts of fluctuations, and so um, you know you can say it depends on, on all of those things through a gradient expansion. And uh, and so leading order, it depends on um, on the, the set of all the other charges um, in the system, because again you're sort of locally looking at a homogeneous state. Um, okay, in general, this is some nonlinear function, it's kind of useless, but you can always linearize about an equilibrium state. And if you linearize, you get a matrix equation um, where you have this matrix gamma ij of, um, that sets the rates at which um, charges relax. And this, gamma, this, this matrix has um, some number of zero modes. 
that correspond to the residual conserved charges. So um, once again, you break integrability, you, you destroy um, almost all the conserved charges, but you might still have a few left over. Like for instance, if you break the Hamiltonian, you still have energy conserved. You might also have, let's say, momentum conserved if you're, um, if you're perturbation were Galen, you might have um, number conserving perturbations, etc. Um, so whatever these um, residual conservation laws are manifest as, um, as zero modes um, of the gamma matrix, that's going to be um, important for what follows. Um, okay, so um, what we want to do now is we want to talk about, um, about the decay of currents. And, um, and so remember, a current for, so let's say you're interested in, in, um, in the transport of some charge alpha, um, which um, for argument's sake, let's say it's the energy, um, and, so the, and so there's an energy current um, that shows up in this continuity equation. Um, and if you want to figure out in general what this, um, what this current is within GHD, what you do is you say, well, you only care about the slow part of the current. And so, um, and so the slow part of the current um, corresponds to its projection onto um, the set of conserved charges that I had in the previous slide. Yes, yeah, so there's some there's some coefficients, um, and um, the current's a vector in some space, and it's written as um, as uh, you know you can, you can say it's got some um, weight on the charges. It's got some other fast stuff um, that decays fast, and that in Euler scale GHD just throw out. Okay. So um, this is of course familiar because if you try and, um, and, and stick this in the integrable case, um, if you stick this expression into, um, into the Kubel formula, um, what you're going to get is you're going to get the, um, the, um, the DC conductivity is um, the, uh, the product of these coefficients times this charge-charge correlator. And of course, it's a conserved charge at the integrable limit, so this charge-charge correlator doesn't depend on time at all, it's just some number times times so this diverges. And, um, and that divergence precisely gives you, um, uh, upon Fourier transform, um, the, um, the delta function um, um, in omega that um, marks the Druda um, peak in the conductivity, right? So that's what happens in the integrable system. And, um, and so um, if you break into ability, what happens instead is that um, you've got to write um, delta um, QI um, of T, which is a thing that's been time evolved. Um, you've got to propagate it back to the initial time. And you do that um, using the, the fact that it propagates via this um, linearized um, matrix of decay rates. So it gives you an exponential decay. Um, and, um, and so um, what you do is um, you, um, you find that, um, that in general, the current's going to decay um, as some sum of Lorentzians, um, and, um, and that gives you this nice compact expression for conductivity. Um, the physics of this expression is quite simple. It just says that um, you had um, a, a delta function through the peak, um, and you broke integrability, but you know you didn't change the thermodynamics of the model. So the, the peak, the weight under the peak is a thermodynamic quantity, so it's still there. It's not changed. But all you can do is you can broaden it out um, by a lifetime, some family of lifetimes. And um, and when you do that, you get this um, expression that basically says that the conductivity, the DC conductivity, is um, is some matrix version of of broadening a Druda peak by a finite lifetime. Um, and um, it takes a bit of massaging, but you can also convert this, um, you can also get a diffusion matrix out of this using the Einstein relation. And uh, again, I don't want to run over, so I'll um, skip this bit, but you can also derive this um, in a somewhat um, different way by starting from um, hydrodynamics, um, linearizing and making gradient expansion, and keeping the leading term to gradient expansion. And the nice thing about this hydrodynamic way of thinking about things is that you also it also tells you how to put in the noise if you want to do um, if you want to do fluctuating hydrodynamics of um, the remaining charges. So all of this stuff is kind of um, formal and simple, and um, and you know not very much. Um, it's 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 fairly tractable once um, you deal with the one difficult thing in the entire program, which is um, figuring out what's happening with um, the matrix of relaxation rates. Okay. And so, um, Jerome already talked about this, so I can um, maybe be um, pretty concise. 
but um, but the point is that if you write down um, uh, Hamiltonian integrability breaking, of course, it's going to have all kinds of operators in it. You might say, well, let's make life simpler by saying that um, all that you're going to allow are operators that couple to um, to the local charge densities um, and their products in some way. Um, you might say, well, okay, you you have some hope of getting a handle on these guys using GHD. Um, but okay, even with these guys, um, the problem is that in general, you're going to be allowed to transfer large amounts of momentum. And so, um, and so the thing that GHD gives you, um, or the thing that's, that's deeply tied to GHD, is the low momentum transfer limit of, um, of the matrix elements of these charge-like operators. Um, and so that only helps you if, um, if you, if you're, um, if you're, um, if um, you're transferring small amounts of momentum. There's a nice plot from an old paper of, of Jacopo's and uh, Miłosz Panfels. Um, so if you're looking at um, small momentum transfer, um, you pretty much get the entire spectral weight just by talking about um, one particle hole excitations. But once you're talking about, um, about reasonably large momentum transfer, um, you can stop there. In fact, um, you know, the one particle hole excitation contains a relatively small amount of spectral weight. There's a lot of spectrum left over that comes from other stuff. And, um, and the other stuff is in principle um, not really accessible, at least at this stage of development within GHD. Okay, so, um, but on the other hand, you do have this nice expression for the, for the hydrodynamic limit of form factors. So one thing you can do is you can say, uh, um, Right, so I'm going to take two attitudes to this in the next um, five or 10 minutes of this talk. So the first attitude is to say, okay, this is all that um, we have access to, let's say, so what can we do with this? And um, immediately you can see that one thing you can do with this is you can talk about um, what happens when you have um, slowly spatial temporally varying noise um, acting on the system. Because in that case, um, if the noise is varying slowly in space and time, then you can only get um, you can only get small momentum transfer events out of GHD, and so those are accurately described um, by um, by the formula by this nice form factor. Um, formula just says that the matrix element um, is proportional to um, the dress charge of the quasi particle under the corresponding um, under the corresponding charge. So um, so one so you can you can write down explicit. Um, collision integrals for this limit, and um, and what this what, what the physical content of this collision integral is is, is that um, the noise couples to every quasi particle um, with a strength proportional to um, its um, to the corresponding um, dress charge of that quasi particle, which kind of makes sense because you know if you have um, if you have charge noise, it's not going to do much to your neutral quasi particles of leading order, um, and um, and so that's that's that sort of that's the intuition that's being um, formalized by this, um, and um, and yeah, so um, so um, you can write down this collision integral, and what it corresponds to is um, if you're used to cold atomic um, jargon, it corresponds to momentum diffusion, or in this case, more generally, rapidity distribution, rapidity diffusion, um, and um, and so you can you can play this game with a lot of um, interesting models, and um, and it actually gives you some insight also into things that happen beyond Euler scale hydro. Because um, because all those things also depend um, in some ways on on these um, dress charges in somewhat similar ways. Um, okay, so um, that's um, that's one um, road you can take. Um, but the problem is, of course, that it restricts you to only thinking about very one very small family of integrability breaking perturbations. In general, um, you have many other kinds of things that can happen, and uh, and this this approach doesn't really get you um, any traction on those. Um, and so, um, one thing you can do is you can try and compute the form factors, but you can also try um, doing something much more brutal. You can try saying, okay, this is a very complicated problem, um, and so instead of trying to attack it directly, you can do what Wigner did, right? So Wigner said. Um, you have complicated molecules. Well, let me not try to solve the complicated molecule. Let me let me just um, treat the problem as somehow um, you know random, make some brutal approximation, and see how good it is. And so that's um, that's the um, the thing we um, most recently tried. Um, and so um, this just uses this idea of GHD to say you know GHD takes um, Gibbs ensembles, spatially inhomogeneous local Gibbs ensembles. 
um, to other Gibbs ensembles um, under China Evolution. And so what you do is you, you try and evolve um, your um, ensemble under, under the, the integrable dynamics. And then what you do is with some, um, with some rate, you replace um, your GGE density matrix um, with um, the, the fully thermal Gibbs density matrix. Um, but that thermal density matrix is constrained to match um, the residual conserved quantity. So for instance, um, if you had a GGE with total energy um, E in some cell, you don't want to replace it with any old thermal state. You want to replace it with a thermal state at that cell that, has, that matches um, the same um, energy. Um, and also, you know, if you have an energy and a charge that's conserved, you've got to match both of those, et cetera. So that's, that's, the, um, that's the algorithm. And, um, and so the good news about this is that um, it basically treats um, nonlinearities because it's just sort of a very brutal thing you're doing with collision integral, but you're treating the integral dynamics exactly and um, not making approximations about it. Um, and of course, you can just pre-compute um, these um, Gibbs states um, um, on, a, on a fine grid so that allows you to, um, to, to perform this time evolution pretty efficiently, at least if you don't have too many residual conserved charges. Um, okay, and this is extensible in various ways. Um, okay, so um, you know this is this is the program. Does it work? Um, and um, apparently, we find that it works really well for reasons that I must say we don't fully conceptually understand yet. Um, so what you do here is um, what we do here is we take say x x z with um, with a staggered um, sigma x field. Um, so this is Hamiltonian, so it preserves energy, but it breaks everything else we can think of. Um, and, um, and so what you, okay, so this program doesn't tell you yet what, what rate to use. Um, and so the, the way we go about this is we say, okay, let's take some reference state, some reference on equilibrium state, time evolve it, and fit it to some specific rate. Um, and, um, and, and that allows you to extract a rate. And this is already a bit of a non-trivial check because the rate shouldn't depend strongly on time. If it does, then, then, then you're obviously doing it wrong. But not only does the rate depend on time, um, but the rate also pretty much follows the family's golden rule scaling that you'd expect in this model on, on general grounds. And, um, and this, this uh, family's golden rule scaling works pretty well, even for quite large integrability breaking perturbations. So, um, so, so this seems to be working pretty well, but okay, it's still not a very rigorous test. Um, a more rigorous test is to say, let me say I pulled out this um, thermalization rate from one um, dynamics problem. Can I now take this, can I now take this rate and, and, and try and um, match um, dynamics from arbitrary other initial states? And so that's what we did on the right. So we took the rate out of our first calculation and then try to predict the second calculation with no leftover free parameters. And as you can see, it works really well. So the lesson here seems to be that, um, that at least in this model and a couple of other things we've looked at, um, there seems to be one dominant rate. And um, once you extract this rate, you can just sort of brutally approximate the, the relaxation dynamics is just dominated by this one dominant relaxation time. Um, this, by the way, isn't a new idea in principle. The relaxation time approximation has been around in classical kinetics um, for an incredibly long time. And, um, and so the general rule is it works a lot of the time. Sometimes it fails horrendously. Um, and, um, and so, but, but, you know, when it doesn't, in, in most cases, when there isn't some reason to expect multiple well-separated relaxation times, um, this is going to um, describe the basic dynamics of relaxation. Okay, so that's, um, and you, oh, yeah, and so in addition to that, you also apply it to both guesses, and this gives you a couple of other um, interesting um, points to make. The first is that um, these states, you can see by I, look very non-Gaussian, um, but, you know, of course, they're still being captured by GHD plus, um, plus um, relaxation time approximation. Um, the GHD evolution is sufficiently non-trivial, and it gives you all this nice structure, um, and it sort of interfaces in a non-trivial way with the relaxation dynamics. Um, and one final comment is that um, even though the relaxation time itself um, might be universal in this approximation, um, the diffusion constants are still, they still form a non-trivial matrix. Once again, because diffusion constant has to do with velocity squared times time, 
and um, and the velocities and dress charges obviously um, are different for different charges, and so you can still get non-trivial diffusion matrix in the generalized RTA. Um, all right, so that's um, about it. Um, this talk. So um, basic points to make. Um, you know, this is a hard problem because um, at some level it involves ingredients that in general are fundamentally outside of GHD. Um, and um, we tried two things. One of them was um, was we considered the case of slowly varying noise and there, or even slow static potentials and other long range interactions, you can do the same way. Um, in all those cases, the point is that um, you don't have much momentum transfer. Um, and when you don't have much momentum transfer, you can use um, these, um, these nice um, GHD type expressions, the form factors. And so in some sense, all of that, um, all of that case is fully within GHD. Um, the general case is not fully within GHD, but we found that you can get a pretty good approximation for it um, just by taking um, GHD and adding a relaxation time um, by hand. Um, and so, um, once again, this model is still this this the art the generalized relaxation time approximation is predictive because um, because you don't um, you only use one time evolution run to predict the relaxation time. And then once you've got that, you have no more fitting parameters. You can fit any other dynamics problem you like um, to that one relaxation time. Um, those are the, I guess, the main messages so far. Um, I mean, the, the thing that would be nice, a lot of things would be nice. The first is to understand the structure of form factors away from the hydrodynamic limit in some more sort of organized, um, principled way than actually having to compute them each time. Um, the, the second, um, thing that would be nice is to um, is to generalize this beyond Euler scale um, that, and you know that would be particularly interesting because of the result that Jacopo presented a couple of days ago I guess now over a week ago um, where um, you see that even if you break um, integrability in XX in, in the Heisenberg model you seem to have anomalous diffusions that's so things like that uh, may be interesting questions going forward uh, all right, thank you for your time. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Saran, for this very nice talk. Um, so are there any questions? Yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if I understood you correctly, in the examples you looked at, this relaxation time approximation worked at short times. It worked to the times that we're able to access, right? I mean, it, it, yeah, but, it gives but you a sense. I mean, so so, yeah. so what, I, what I find kind of easy to believe in a sense that at late times it would be good, mm -hmm. but at short times, why does it work at short times? Um, I mean, you can ask the same thing about GHD, right? I mean, it is an asymptotic late time theory, but empirically, um, um, it works well for short times. And the, also, the, the other answer is there's a bit of cheating here, right? I mean, we took a model where GHD works well at short times. Um, you'd always look at problems where the GHD um, versus TBD agreement at short times is terrible. And in that case, adding a relaxation time is not going to make it any less terrible. Um, but um, if you pick, the lesson here is if you pick a model where GHD works pretty well at short times, um, then, um, you know, the relaxation time approximation um, is also capturing the non integral dynamics at pretty short times. Thanks. Other questions? So, so can I uh, technical question? So, uh, how do you how do you prepare uh, the state on on the left of this slide? Um, this is like a local um, thermal state, right? It's yeah, but so what, what does it mean that you have a, a tensor product? Of, of, I mean, what is it? Yeah, that's right. It's a yeah. From the point of view of the TBD, it's sort of um, it's a um, it's it's a it's 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 an it's an MPO describing um, a state with like some local temperature profile. With sorry, some some local. With some with some temperature profile. So, so the yeah, temperature is um, right. But then I mean, so it means that you 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 have product state and each you blocks uh, sites and then you. Yeah, no, that's right. So, I mean, you think about it as uh, I mean, you also think about it as some kind of low rank MPO. Right, but then okay. So uh, I another, I think this is also related to what Fabian asked. Uh, that yeah. this is, uh, I mean, so another question is: uh, do you, Can you predict something for for um, uh, uh, pre-thermalization in in homogeneous settings 
more traditional to to other studies of pre-terminalization. Like um, like here, it's a bit it's it's not surprising that you end up yeah. eventually with a thermal state. But if you take, for example, the example by uh, Jerome, where he ends uh, he has some non-trivial driving there, uh, even though the, the, the there there is some kind of uh, going beyond integrability, you don't end up with a thermal state. So maybe here it also has to do with initial state. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, but I think the point is that if you did a quench, right, if you did a quench that created a bunch of quasi-particles, um, you would have to find the GGE first. And you'd have Which to have you can some do, time well, you, you can do, I mean, system. You can do that, yeah, yeah, but it's going to, I mean, I guess, yeah, so once you have the GGE, you can, you can run this just fine on that GGE and you can compute correlation functions, whatever you like. But of course, I mean, the, the initial evolution to the GGE, you're not going to capture. No, no, of that's, course, of course. But also, I mean, that, that my claim is that the subsequent dynamics, I mean, might my, my hide some surprises. Uh, maybe it's, I mean, so people have, have looked at these kinds of, yeah. of you know, uh, pre-thermalization in the sense. You uh -huh. first wait for the system to equilibrate and then you, you drift towards yeah. something which is not the GGE, but then it's more complicated. It's, it's very complicated to see what happens. Yeah, no, there might be surprises. I agree with that in principle. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, maybe me. <clears throat> yeah. so, uh, I, so, of course, the reason why uh, GHT works here, even I mean, everything works from zero time is because you're already your initial state is uh, adrodynamic, right? Uh, you're talking yes. very long, the form, uh, slow. Well, you know, no, a, a few fights for um, the TBD. Yeah, yeah, I started from a thermal state. Uh, um, but yeah, so I mean, so you're saying that uh, there should be only, I mean, it seems to be a like dominant uh, gamma. I mean, dominant, yeah. um, so maybe, so this should suggest that maybe there is a, a dominant uh, process, or if you want a dominant form factor, or, uh, or you think, uh, no. I mean, um, yeah, no, I think that's 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 probably correct. Um, that somehow so in cases, in cases where this works, I, you have some I, dominant process. If I would write the equation uh, that you write yeah. for the um, time evolution or row exactly, mm -hmm. like with yeah. the sum over from factor, could I uh, reabsorb everything into the gamma, or uh, I would look? I mean, is gamma given by a sum of processes or? Uh, different processes would contribute with different terms in the in the equation which is um so i mean the way you'd write it obviously is you'd have to write it as a um as the bolton equation and the full distribution function right so the distribution function in in general is going to evolve in some non-trivial way it's not going to get replaced with a thermal distribution function at some rate um but essentially what you'd be doing if you made this approximation is you'd somehow be taking all of that stuff out of the sum and um, and somehow evaluating some average over like um, overall rapidity, something like that, because you know you have an integral of like a product of of some process times um, the distribution function at that at that value of the quasi particle rapidity and stuff, right? So in, in order to sort of pull it, in order to pull a full rate out of this, you have to somehow break up that integral and say I'm going to just like pretend that um, that I can integrate without the distribution function. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, I mean, I don't think this is an exact, this, I don't think this is ever exactly true. I think this is only um, a useful approximation in cases where there isn't strong dependence of like um, of relaxation time on like where you are in the distribution function. I mean, the surprise to me is that it works at all. Other questions? Yeah, if not, then let's thank Sarah again for this very